Hey everyone, we're just getting started here. Uh, there's a couple minutes before 12 o'clock here on the East Coast. So um, hang in there with us for about a minute and a half, two minutes and we'll get started then. Looking forward to this presentation by Marcus Myers on JavaScript testing for UIs. So once again, we'll get started just in a couple minutes. Hang in there with us. Thank you. All right, so my clock says noon on the East Coast. So let's get started. My name is Paul Merrill. I'm with Beaufort Fairmont Automated Testing Services. I'm happy to be here today. Uh, at Beaufort Fairmont, we focus on test automation. We help companies with their challenges with test automation, setting up strategies for them, and then helping them implement them. We do that through consulting, training, and dedicated experts. So if you need help with test automation, give us a yell. Marcus is one of our employees. He's a consulting uh, software engineer in test. And today he's going to be talking about JavaScript testing for UIs. That's changed a little bit. We talked a little bit about TypeScript as being a part of this and testing UIs. As we've gone along over the last week or so developing the talk, as Marcus has developed it, we've realized that we're probably only going to dive into the JavaScript part and testing some components with JavaScript and focusing on a tool called Jest. So if you were looking forward to TypeScript, if you were looking forward to a bunch of UI testing, there will be a little bit of UI stuff in here, um, but mostly we will focus on Jest. And I would just rather tell you that to get started than to have you be surprised. Um, completely understand if you had different expectations, but want to make sure to set that up to begin with. So once again, glad to be here. I have started this thing several months ago, and it's been a couple months since we've been with you guys, and I appreciate you being online today for this webinar, but I started the, the B list, which is a bunch of thank yous, and I listed a bunch of people on here. I don't like to give away personal information, but you know, you might see your name on there. There might be like a Bob Q, and maybe you're Bob Q. I probably don't know that many Bob Q, so that's probably you, um, but these are people who have done good things for us, whether they are customers, whether they're people that we work with, vendors, um, whoever they are. I just want to say thanks, and this is one way to do it. So if you made the B list today, I'm excited for you. Make sure to tweet about it with at Bo Fairmont and uh, D. Paul Merrill. So as we get started here, I always want to tell you guys about upcoming events. I'm going to be speaking as a panelist for the Automation Guild coming up in just a matter of a couple weeks. The Automation Guild, if you don't know, is a wonderful test automation online conference. It's put on by Joe Calantonio, who's the host of Test Talks podcast. He does a terrific job with it. He brings on a lot of great talent for test automation. The pricing is wonderful. The content is wonderful. You can watch it from your office. It's an easy sell to your manager who probably already has training budget. So jump in and get that. They don't have to fly you anywhere and it's a lot less expensive. The next webinar, I'm going to do that one on identifying test gaps. This is one that I just recently came up with. It's brand new content, I'm working through it. Uh, I look forward to sharing it with you. A lot of people approach this different ways. How do we identify what we're not testing and the gaps in our testing? So that's what that is about. Make sure to join us on the 11th for that, and I'll have a sign-up sheet on the web page soon. Speaking of the web page, you may have noticed it's been a little down lately, uh, a little completely down. So it'll be up on Monday. We're coming up with a new site. Had a couple issues there, but that'll be back up very soon. We'll also be out in Columbus, Ohio. I'm so thrilled that we're at the point with this company where we can sponsor some really cool events. One of the things we're sponsoring is the Automation Guild, so look for our information there. We're happy to be able to sponsor it. Another one is QA or the Highway. This is put on by the group QA or the Highway up in Columbus, Ohio. They're a group of testers that put on their own nonprofit deal there. They get about 500 people a year, I understand. I've never been to Columbus, so this should be fun on the 19th. We'll see if I can slog through the snow there. Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, the TriTog meetup. I'll be speaking there on the 6th and looking forward to meeting some new people there. 
Um, a couple other things coming up, but I couldn't get them all on the slide. I wanted to make sure that I shared with you whatever I could. So if you're going to one of these events, make sure to reach out and say hi. I can't wait to meet you there. Everybody knows, hopefully, we do a $50 Amazon card giveaway. All you got to do is stick around and pay attention, and uh, you may be the one to win this. So with that said, I want to introduce Marcus to you, and I'm going to bring him off of mute here and start uh, shifting over to his screen and all that, if I can remember how to do this. Hang in there, hang in there. Um, let's see. So, Marcus, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. How are you guys doing? Hey, well, thanks, for, thanks for being here today. I'm going to make you the presenter and pass this off to you, and then I'm going to do your intro here as soon as that gets started. Uh, Marcus has been with us for a while at Beaufort Fairmont. And we're happy to have him. He does wonderful work for each of our clients that he works with. Marcus is a consulting software engineer in test at Beaufort Fairmont Automated Testing Services. Marcus earned his degree in web design, but quickly gained a knack for testing through on-the-job experience. A jack-of-all-trades and perpetual learner, he provides consulting, training, and other services related to automated testing to several clients. When working on a project, Marcus' goal is to expand the stability and depth of automation efforts using the appropriate tools, frameworks, and approach. Marcus, you know I'm thrilled to have you here. Thanks for doing this. No, thank you, Paul. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to present this and uh, really appreciate everyone hopping on. And uh, um, hopefully we, we learned something fun today and maybe uh, inspire some people to start doing more JavaScript testing. So. Yeah, so look, before I drop off right here, before I go on mute and turn my face off, there's a couple things I want to do. Number one, I want to tell you you're sharing the blue screen right now. Number oh, two, excellent. this, I'm going to pull up a poll, and that's going to change what everybody sees. We're going to do two polls really quick. Number one, what is your current role? I like to know about this because it helps us gauge the content that we give you. So Marcus is going to look at the responses to these, and we're going to figure out exactly how to gear this. Right now, it looks like Test Automation Engineer is winning, which is what I would expect. So that's cool. We've got about 56% of the vote in. And I'll close it off here in just a minute when we get closer to 70. And, and there we are at 70. Okay, just one more second. Get those votes in. All right. 77% of the vote in. This is what I see. Uh, let me see. Um, I guess I can't share it here. So 49% Test Automation Engineers. I, I can share it. Here we go. Test automation engineers, a few managers, always good to have them around so we know what to do. Developers, uh, testers, interesting. It's always interesting to see those. I'm going to do one more of these. I'm going to hide the results and share one more, and then we're going to jump into the content. So this poll says, how much experience do you have testing UIs with JavaScript or Jest? So yes, some, or none. JavaScript or Jest. And that is an or. It's not an and. So I guess it could be an inclusive or exclusive or, what do you think, Marcus, inclusive, exclusive or? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, so uh, 40, pre, let's see. So I'm going to close this out. We've got 83% voting and share the results really quickly. So none, 46% none and 36% some. So this is, you guys are in the right place. Those of you who said yes, if there's anything you can add to the conversation, add it into the questions or the uh, chat and Marcus, you're on. Awesome. Can you see my can you see my screen right now? We can. We see the intro to JavaScript testing slide. Awesome. That's what I'm doing. That's so great. <laughs> All right. Let me move things around real quick. It's blocking blocking my uh, blocking my side of the screen a little bit. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you everyone so much again for attending. I really appreciate you showing up. And I want to apologize to anyone that that did come in, uh, maybe wanting a more UI focused uh, webinar. When I was preparing this, I was really ambitious and I kind of wanted to <laughs> just cover everything. But when I really got down to it, I felt like um, to make this more friendly to people who were completely maybe new to JavaScript testing, I realized I needed to step back a bit and kind of show how to get, basically focus focus more on the basics of the tool it, rather than getting into what, what I consider a bit more complex, which is testing the actual UI components. Um, I kind of wanted to focus on getting a little deeper into the, the logic part of the JavaScript because then the tests tend to be a little more simple, a little more understandable. And then 
it would help us focus on just how the tool works rather than maybe how components work. And if this is something, you know, at the end that you guys are interested in learning more, um, we would be happy to do more webinars where we can go deeper into mocking because um, that was another thing I wanted to do is I really wanted to do mocking. Uh, but they're just, again, I felt like I wanted to reduce the scope and make this a little more friendly to people who are new to this kind of testing and kind of go make sure make sure we built up a good foundation. Uh, but yeah, definitely, I'd love to do more with component uh, UI component testing and uh, mocking later and doubles. But really for this, I apologize to anyone wanting some super, super, um, you know, high level, high, high level kind of uh, thing. This is really going to be kind of more of an introductory thing. So um, as Paul said, uh, today I'm going to be, and I just said, <laughs> today I'm going to be going over the basics of JavaScript testing, um, appro approaches that I follow and the tooling that, that I've chosen to use. Um, getting started with JavaScript testing can be really intimidating. I think it's it's something that, um, you know, it's still kind of new, honestly, at least at this scope, when you introduce Node.js and as the stack moves forward, it can get really intimidating and be, it can be difficult sometimes to figure out what to do. And this is especially hard too. Not a lot of, um, not a lot of testers have web development experience and that can be really helpful for JavaScript testing. So I'm hoping with today's webinar that I can change that by showing you guys some tools, by showing you some approach. Uh, to think about when testing your web applications. And there we go. <laughs> it's like, don't, don't, uh, don't betray me, PowerPoint. Uh, so let, let's get into more details about what exactly I'm going to talk about today. So first part is I'm going to go through an intro to um, or a preview or overview of the JavaScript driven stack. Uh, I'm going to talk about the difference between uh, traditional web development and the full stack development with Node. Um, after that, I'll go, I'm going to be talking about tooling and approach. Uh, this is where I'll talk about what tool I'll be using, kind of the whys and hows and kind of my approach or principles to, uh, to testing and what I'm trying to achieve. Um, after that, we're going to get into more nitty gritty, the meaty stuff that a lot of people like. We're going to get into a test demo. Um, I'm going to talk about the different features of the tool, kind of break down the different parts of what a test is to this tool. Um, look at the actual tests themselves obviously look at the application kind of show you how i dig through and then run those tests the most exciting part where i run tests um we're gonna make some of them fail on purpose to show you what test failure looks like and things like that and then uh time permitting we're going to hopefully answer some questions so so let's get started let's let's talk about let's talk about the java script driven dev stack so javascript exciting uh, JavaScript has been around for over 20 years. Uh, it's old enough to buy a pack of cigarettes, but not old enough to drink yet, so it'll get there. Um, initially, it was used for front-end development. Uh, this is to basically drive web page scripting. Um, but now the language has really kind of taken off. It's gained a lot of popularity with the introduction of server-side applications language um, with Node.js. So let's look at the traditional stack first. So obviously this is a traditional uh, client, server, web server, and database stack. Um, and the, with this, the majority of the business logic is on the server side with uh, you know Java, Python, PHP, C++, C++ uh, you, you choose what you wanna use basically. Um, so in this instance, the back end does a lot of the heavy lifting and the presentation layer is essentially just a result of server side rendering. So the your back end code basically is going to, you know, serve up, you're, you're gonna need a web server, um, a dedicated web server, in fact, from your application server. Um, this usually requires a team to have a dedicated front end, uh, back end developer, a lot of times a DBA, um, when you think about testing with a stack like this, most people think for the UI, they're thinking, you know, Selenium web driver or some manual testing for the front end and then like unit integration testing at the code level. So let's look at the full stack to show this some comparison here. So 
full, this is this is kind of a model of the uh, full stack dev. So what you'll notice here is that the a full stack dev with Node.js kind of moves the application code forward in the stack. Um, the great part about this is that there's now like a common language throughout the stack with it being, you know, whatever your scripting language is, in our case, it's going to be JavaScript. Um, so the idea of that front end dedicated developer and back end developer is kind of less relevant. Now you're kind of looking for a full stack developer. Um, great part here is that there's no need for a dedicated web server. Um, since there's no server side rendering and the page is essentially static and it's going to get served up its content uh, through like REST API. It's going to serve up some, some JSON usually, um, or it's going to get rendered. Your data is going to get rendered somehow through, through JavaScript and scripting. So another kind of advantage of this approach and why people are really adopting it is there's better performance and speed compared to the traditional stack. Um, and the reason that this is important and I wanted to kind of introduce is that this this shift really, I believe, changes the skill sets and approach required for testing. The, the mindset of the traditional separation where your backend code is, is very kind of much more separated from your front end code just isn't the case anymore with Node. Um, the, the stack really kind of, like I said, it pushes forward and it shrinks. And um, I want to, that's what I want to kind of get into next is kind of how now this is, that really is going to change the way that we approach testing and think about testing a web application. Um, and really quickly, here's some examples of some full stack JavaScript. Um, for front end, you've got like AngularJS. I'm sure you guys have heard a lot of this and you may even be working with a team that's using some of these. Uh, we've got React, we've got Vue, Knockout, uh, Backbone.js. I think one maybe they're missing here is probably Ember. Um, and then your back end, you've got uh, you've got Node Express, uh, Meteor, Sales, RESTFI, Keystone JS, and then for database, if you're really if you're really brave, you could use MongoDB. Uh, I think it's a cool tool, but I've had some I've just had some uh, uh, some pains working on some teams with it. It's a cool it's a cool database, uh, a NoSQL uh, tool. But there's also you know MySQL, very very you know uh, tried tested. Uh, Postgres, uh, SQL, CouchDB, and uh, Cassandra, as well as uh, I think like I think MariaDB is another one that uh, I think is is really gaining popularity. So, kind of getting back to getting back to uh, my point there is uh, how does this you know how does this change testing? Um, I think because the stack is shifted forward, uh, more of the application logic is available to us as a tester. And the great part too is it's all kind of using a common language. So the development code, especially for maybe a new tester getting the JavaScript, you're gonna be writing your, your testing in the, essentially the same language with the same syntax. So the great part about that too is now your, your developers are a resource to literally help you write automation rather than maybe, you know, maybe you're leveraging like a Selenium tool in, um, that uses, uh, let's say, Python, but then your developers are in some other stack. Or it's just, um, I feel like with this, it's it's a great way then that the developers can be a resource to testers and they can kind of um, uh, help leverage that since the link, they, they are using a common language. Ah, excuse me. So, and I think we kind of talked about this um, just a moment ago, but traditionally most of us look at uh, web app testing, and we'll often think Selenium WebDriver. Uh, I think that Selenium WebDriver is a great tool for end-to-end -end, uh, testing and for browser testing, uh, like compatibility testing. But it also has some limitations um, that can make it be really fragile and error-prone. You need to have a web server, um, a web uh, driver uh, server set up. You need to have some sort of browsers uh, set up that are ready to test. You have to worry about the the um the browser drivers and having the newest versions so there's just a lot there's there's a lot there that that can make fragileness there's a lot of configuration um so i wouldn't i wouldn't want to put all my testing kind of into that basket at, le at least from from a front end aspect um with a full javascript stack using node.js uh, we can now test the ui components that make up the static page and the scripting that drives functionality through the JavaScript. Uh, 
then we could use UI testing more for specific test cases and like browse, like, like I said before, browser compatibility and a small subset of end-end workflows. Um, so let's let's get into tooling and approach. So tooling and approach. And there's uh, Luigi there. His tool of choice is going to be it's going to be a hammer. And sometimes it feels that way in test automation, right? Sometimes it feels like you just got to take a hammer and you just gotta you just gotta smash smash what you're doing. So um, there's a multitude of JavaScript testing tools out there. And it seems like it seems like there's like a new one every day, honestly. Um, I would guess that most of you out there are probably most familiar with Karma, Mocha, and Chai. I'm trying to remember what the results of that survey was, if if you guys were familiar with it. In those that that stack is like a great tool, but it kind of conforms to more of the traditional testing stack. Um, for me, and, and Paul already kind of mentioned what I'm using, but uh, I don't really, uh, I've kind of shifted from using Karma Mocha and Chai to Jest, and that's for a few reasons, which I'll, which I'll talk about, try to kind of go through briefly. Um, so again, why, why not Karma Mocha and Chai? Uh, one reason is that stack has a lot more dependencies uh, compared to just um, the tests overall tend to be slower. This is a side effect of using a real browser environment. And uh, another reason is a substantial configuration to get started. There's just a lot, a lot that has to get configured and kind of uh, set up before you can really start writing tests. And I feel like that can be a hurdle to overcome that the, that the just kind of, um, kind of takes care of that. So, and to kind of explain that a little further, the goal I'm trying to achieve with, with my testing is a kind of more modular and isolated testing uh, within the testing stack. And Karma Mocha and Chai is less conducive to that since it does use a real browser environment. Um, so like I said, having that real browser environment is great if you're wanting to test browser compatibility, but it also adds, again, adds that extra layer of kind of flakiness and instability um, that can make it a little more of a challenge to really focus in on the JavaScript and even the UI components that generate the stack pages. So, uh, we already kind of mentioned it before, but the tool I'm using is Jest. Uh, Jest is a node-based JavaScript testing tool and their tagline is delightful JavaScript testing. And, uh, to, to be completely honest, it is, it is really nice. It is kind of, it can be delightful in the fact that it just, it seems to work so well. It seems so um, just logical in its approach and ease of use. It was developed by Facebook's JavaScript Foundation team to test Java, JavaScript code for React applications. But now they're touting this tool as a test for testing any JavaScript application. Um, and it's getting a lot of traction in the JavaScript development community. So. so the main selling point of Jest is that it's zero configuration testing platform. And if you're building using React, Jest is already configured when you create a React project. So that's completely true if you're using React. Uh, I would keep in mind though, <laughs> this, is where, this is where that tagline maybe has some gray areas. Um, just does require some minimal configuration if you're using a different stack you're going to have to install it with npm you're going to have to set up uh your environment file you're, there's some stuff you're going to have to do uh let's say you're using angular js instead um it's going to require some small amount of configuration so to be fair the tagline is true to an extent but even even though either way if you're using like mocha and chai you're going to have to do some configuration setup with just it's it's still very minimal so who is using Jest? Well, look at look at these great logos. So we've got obviously Facebook since they developed it. Uh, we've got Twitter that uses it, New York Times, Spotify, Airbnb, uh, Instagram, and a lot of others. So I think uh, for me, this may seem may seem innocuous to some like, well, you know, what why does it matter who's using who's using this tool? Um, for me, knowing that there's a solid adoption base from uh, the tech leaders in the app development world is a good sign. Um, this tells me that Jest isn't going anywhere. 
and that uh, support for it and resources will continue to grow as the tool kind of grows and, and as adoption increases. So I think this is a good sign that it's a good tool to, to investigate. Um, and I'd like to kind of talk to a little more of the details, even though I touched on someone kind of talking about the differences, but um, so just may not be the best tool for your organization. This, you know, depending on your tech stack, depending on the skill sets in your team, but I want to highlight a few aspects as to why it could be a good tool for your organization to look into. First off, this is kind of my, one of my favorite parts about Just is that it uses this really fast emulated browser called JSDOM. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Phantom JS. A lot of people use it for Selenium testing. Uh, I think it gets used in a few other stacks, but this is somewhat similar to that. It, it allows us to focus on isolating the JavaScript and the components without validating browser compatibility. We're still we still have a DOM. We still have you know basically a place for the static site to render but we don't have to worry about maybe the difference between Chrome or Firefox or maybe you know Safari and Edge. It's more about right now, let's focus at the most you know, more isolated level to make sure that in this kind of curated DOM environment that our JavaScript works the way that we expect. Um, the next part that is really great about Jest is it has built-in code coverage. You're gonna hear this quite a few times about the, the great part about Jest is because it's zero configuration, it also means a lot of pretty much everything you need to get started on your basic test is built in. You're not going to see a lot of imports to get things done. So built-in code coverage is another thing that's great about Jest. It's completely built in, no additional setup or libraries needed. Just add dash dash coverage to your Jest command. And you can even configure this in your package.json, which I, I can kind of show you guys that if you want. But essentially, it, it's literally no configuration code coverage, you can get a really good idea where, where your code's at, uh, where your tests are at and covered. So third one is uh, it has, again, going <laughs> kind of touting its built-in capabilities. Uh, it has a built-in robust mocking capability. Um, again, no need to import separate mocking libraries since it's baked in. Fortunately, the scope of this, it's trying to state a very basic level. Mocking is a, I think it's a higher level um, skill set. I definitely, if this is something you guys are interested, email us, uh, you know, tweet at us, let us know if you're interested in seeing Jest mocking or even just JavaScript mocking. We can look at, because you can bring mocking libraries into Mocha and Chive. Let us know. Uh, I'd love to do that. But um, unfortunately, with the scope of this, it just, I didn't feel like there'd be time. But Jest does have a great built in robust mocking library. No need to, no need to import that. Another thing, great thing about Jest is parallel execution. Uh, again, another thing I'd love to demo. This is like going through a list of things I'd love to just do a whole webinar on for you guys. So uh, again, let us know if, if parallel execution is something you're interested in. Um, just let us know. Uh, hit, hit us up. So, so as as your test suite grows, this is a huge huge benefit in reducing time to run your tests when you can run them in parallel. And uh, it could even allow you, if you want, to leverage your tests. It's kind of like a light performance uh, set if desired. Maybe you don't want to get into a new stack just yet. You could basically run a lot of tests in parallel and, and see how your, your application performs. Uh, and last thing that I kind of want to uh, um, talk about is, is just is really easy to integrate other tools and libraries by installing through NPM. Um, starting with that no no, that base of no config really makes adding libraries really fast and it decreases your ramp up time. You literally usually just jumping in, just understanding the app and starting to write tests. So um, let's get into approach. And again, this approach is kind of, it may not apply directly just to JavaScript testing, but I wanted to kind of touch on this to help you guys understand as, as we go, uh, go into the demo, what what my approach is, what my intentions are with when I'm testing an application like this, and kind of what my some of my goals are, and the things that I that I kind of um, uh, try to attain as I'm writing, and also when I'm trying to vet tools or trying to create my own um, framework wrappers around different tooling. So, so first one is isolation. So. We really want, and I've kind of already gone over this a little bit, but we want to isolate the code as much as possible and focus on testing and verifying the smallest piece of functionality. 
generally, the more we attempt to verify or act upon or the more actions we take in a test, the more fragile the test is going to be. Um, we also want the tests themselves to be isolated in the sense that one test shouldn't rely on another. It shouldn't be a chain of reliance because that can cause a lot of fragileness. They should really be, this is also, you may have heard the term atomic testing. Basically, we want we want our tests to be atomic and very self-reliant. They shouldn't rely on the test before it and the test after it shouldn't rely on that test. We wanna keep them very isolated, very like, uh, very, like module-like. The next kind of approach principle is depth. So whenever I look at a new app, I want to start at the deepest level of functionality. And that's that's again where the focus of this webinar sort of changes. When I started to look at the app that I, I had kind of uh, written and piecemeal together with some code that I'd found, um, I wanted to, what I will often do with a, a new application, I try like, where's the, where's the deepest layer I can go? It's usually the least fragile, and it's usually the cheapest type of test to write, at least effort, because it's very deep, usually very simple. Um, the, the more that we can cover at deeper parts of the stack, generally the less we'll have to write at the higher levels, which tend to be more fragile. Um, generally speaking, the further we move up that stack, the flakier our tests become. And that makes, again, that also makes maintenance a lot more painful because you're going to be going in and changing those failing tests where if you can have more stable tests at a lower level, you may write more tests, but you'll probably do less maintenance because there'll be a lot more generally a lot more stable because they'll be simpler. They'll isolate the logic. And it also makes knowing what failed much clearer. And that's kind of where actually the next point is, um, is readability as well. So these tests should be structured in a way that anyone could, within reason, go into your project and understand what you're trying to verify. We want to keep code as clean as possible, avoid repeating ourselves, so write helpers, write modules, and unfortunately, Again, with the scope, uh, there's you're not going to really see a whole lot. You'll see a little bit of helper writing, but not a lot, just because I really wanted to just get down to the kind of the the basics of this tool. Um, but this is something we could explore later too. If if anyone out there is interested, let us know. Um, so avoid repeating yourself. Write helpers. Naming should be descriptive of your variables, of your your methods, your classes. Make sure it's descriptive of of what that is. And there's always room to improve that. I'm sure you guys will see stuff where you're like, oh, sure, he says he wants readability, but then he did this. So everyone's everyone's got improvement. Also for demos, it's like just getting something to run was you know ultimately my goal. So sometimes great variable names, but I try my best always to have a good readable project that's organized and easy to understand. And so last one. Um, the principle that I kind of go for is I go for code coverage. So even though code coverage doesn't necessarily reflect that we're covering all of our test cases or our regression tests, it's still a good metric that we want to be aware of when writing any kind of testing. And in this case, um, we, we get it pretty, we get it pretty much for free because of the tool we're using. So that's great. So enough talking, let's get, let's get to the demo. So I'm going to uh, break into the app and kind of uh, show you guys how it works. Um, kind of uh, walk through the app the way that I would if it was the first time I was going through it. Kind of trying to find what I would call like the basement of the app. What's the lowest? What's the lowest level I can access within reason without a lot of effort and start testing it to get value at that very deep level so that I can start building my testing infrastructure from the ground up. So let me end this and I'm going to run the app first. So hopefully, hopefully everything works for me. So let's let's start the app and kind of look at it really quickly and then get into kind of the nitty gritty details. All right. And this is another thing, I know I keep like saying how great uh, Node is, it, it's a great stack. It has its issues, but just the fact that I'm able to start this without a dedicated web server really is really nice. Just hitting NPM start um, is, is so nice, especially, excuse me, I got a little bit runny nose. Especially for testing, it's just so nice to be able to fire up the app very quickly, be able to kind of explore and check it out and um, not have to have a lot of config on my end or understanding of a dedicated web server. I'm not having to run Apache 
or uh, anything like that. It's really nice to be able to just fire something up really quick. And that's kind of how the tests work too. Um, so this is a, re, uh, a React Native app. Uh, so Jest came pre-installed in it, and I'll be showing you that uh, as, a, as a no dependency. And I was able to start writing tests with this right away. Uh, I did write this app. Uh, I, some of it I wrote completely myself. Some of it I borrowed code that I found and kind of changed it to work the way I wanted. Um, I decided to go with the calculator app just for the simplicity of its functionality. It's very straightforward. That way we could focus on a good foundation of basic concepts of test writing with Jess and not worry about possibly some of the complications of a, of a more in-depth app. Uh, granted, this isn't the most accurate maybe for real world applications that you guys will be testing, but I think that the concepts and principles that we'll go over will most definitely uh, cross over. So let's actually look at this app. Everyone knows, I think, I assume everyone knows how a calculator works. So it takes in, it takes in a value, um, it takes in an operator, and, and then it takes in a number where you can hit equals and it does some sort of arithmetic. And this one, um, I guess, is maybe a little more sophisticated because it can keep an ongoing number. You can keep, uh, um, basically continue to keep doing arithmetic until you completely clear it out. Um, so again, nothing, nothing super exciting here, but I think a good basic app um, that has really understandable functionality so that everyone can grasp it and understand how the tests work. So that was kind of my, that's really just my intention there. So let's uh, let's shut it down and get into the code. Let's see here. Hopefully, I can try to see if they can zoom that in a little. It doesn't zoom that in. So for my ID, I'm just going to be using Atom. I use a lot of other IDs. I use IntelliJ. Uh, I use Visual Studio. But for for projects like this, where I kind of just want to quickly put something together, I like to use Atom because Atom's kind of whatever you're, it's an IDE that's whatever you want it to be. You can install whatever kind of uh, plugins or add-ons that you want and really make it your own. Um, it's not set up best for Node right now. That's something that I realized when I was kind of working on this and um, kind of developing the app and developing the tests. So, but uh, what's great is that I can put the work in and look look for some good add-ons and, and determine what, what, uh, what I want this to really be. So, um, so let's let's take a look at this app and kind of kind of work our way down to the components and show you kind of what I would do. So because because I wrote this, well, and also pulled in some code, I, I know how this app works, obviously. So the, the top the top level here is really app.js. This is essentially the main React component. This is in charge of handling like click events, app state. And it calls our calculate function um, and, and renders the UI component. So, and again, this is something I'd love to go over testing in the future. Just let us know if there's something you're interested. But I really want to kind of dig through this app the way I would and sort of help you understand how I would try to find that very deepest level and then work my way up so that I would test as little as possible actually at the component level because I want to be testing a lot at the deeper um, more script levels where we're doing more heavy lifting, we maybe are doing more actions or um, processing. And then at that component level, just focus on what does the component do? What are the, instead of trying to test the, the functionality through it, maybe just test the important parts, whether things render, whether click states um, are honored and things like that. Uh, so here you can see what we handle click and we're calling calculate and we're sending the state and the button name. So let, what I would do then is I would look and say, okay, let, how deep can I get here and how does this sort of work? So we'll go to calculate. Now calculate was something I did kind of find. I did not write this myself. I did make some modifications. But the important part about calculate is it, it deals with key press content. It determines kind of what actions the UI is attempting, tries to interpret it and calls the operate function to perform arithmetic. So we'll, we'll, that's kind of the important part. And so you can see here, operate is called, and it looks like it sends essentially three objects. You've got total. So this is kind of your ongoing total, or technically if your total is the first number you just started calculating, that could just be your first number. 
uh, your next number, and then whatever operation that you're trying to do. So operate comes from, well, from operate. So what I would normally do then is, okay, so there's another there's another layer deeper to this. Let me dig a little further to see, see if I could find the basement of this app. So let's dig in and let's go to operate. So here, this is starting to look, this is starting to look pretty simple. So operate expects those two numbers and expects some sort of operation. Um, its job is to, is to basically parse the numbers as, as floats because it's coming from a UI as string, essentially. So we've got to take that because anything, basically anything that's passed into calculate is just all string. So we're just calculates taking string and interpreting essentially interpreting key presses and interpreting that state as string. So to do actual arithmetic, we're going to need to parse these. Uh, here, maybe a little lazy to parse them as float just for the example. But essentially, I'm taking those string, the string in as numbers, and I'm parsing them as floats. And then um, I'm interpreting the operation that was passed and then calling um, looks like another class. So we can go even deeper. Uh, called math, and then math looks like it has add, subtract, multiply, and divide. So that's what I would do again. I would say, okay, let me look at math. And again, this may not be realistic, but I think for the the sake of the demo, I kind of wanted to try to break this out the way I would if this was any other app. So I'd want to make every class or function should be doing kind of, if I can help it one thing, um, try to, tr and I, and really, ideally, if I were to go into this and really optimize, I could probably break calculate out into a lot of pieces. Um, but for the sake of this, I had to kind of borrow some of the code for calculate. It wasn't something I had um, the, the time to kind of write. So I did have to use some borrowed code there. So let's, let's look at math. So this is, this is kind of the basement of our application, right? This is, you can't really, there, there isn't any other sort of deeper application code. For this um and i can see my time is getting short i need to go faster uh so really quickly we've got a couple things here in this class we've got uh, check args so this is just determining whether the arguments that are passed into math are basically whether the the type number and whether um whether we actually receive two arguments this might seem redundant or unnecessary if you look at operate but I wanted to write math as if I didn't know who was going to consume it. I think that's a good practice is uh, don't assume anything about who's going to kind of consume or leverage your class. Try to make it handle a lot of different situations within reason. So writing check args was me essentially wanting to make sure, want to make sure no matter who's leveraging this, because I don't know if it's going to be operate, maybe they call math at the calculate level and they end up sending in some bad values. I want to be able to handle that. Um, so that's why I wrote check args. So we've got add, again, eat and subtract, divide, multiply. It's essentially just going to return return a number uh, back to whoever's calling it. So lots of different lots of different test cases that are possible here, right? Like for one, we we look at we look at add. We could say if we want to sort of test out the path to check args, we could pass only one argument into add. Or we could pass non-numbers. We could pass in nulls. Um, we could also test out just proper arithmetic, right, in all of these class, uh, not classes, excuse me, um, kind of functions of this class. So um, that's kind of where I would probably start. Here's where I would start writing tests. This is like the basement of it, the very base level. So let's uh, let's take a look at what I wrote. Sorry, so I make sure I have my <laughs> my notes with me. So let's break down the components of this. This is a uh, this is a jest test. So one thing to keep in mind is jest will run any test file it sees um, in a test folder. It's going to have two, um, I think, uh, technically like under slashes around a folder. But also, if you just name a file spec.js at the end or test.js. Um, then no configuration is really required. And when you run Jest, it'll run these tests. So you can see this file is math test.js. So if I run if I run npm test or I run Jest, it'll pick up this file and uh, and attempt to run it. So first thing you're going to see here is 
uh, an import and it looks just like, uh, this is the great part, it just looks like a normal JavaScript import, right? We're importing our math class, we're giving it a path, and this is so we can leverage it and uh, put it under test. Uh, the next thing you'll see is a describe. This is part of Jest as well. Think of describe as literally a description of your test category or a test container. You'll also notice that if you if you look a little further that I have some nested describes. This isn't necessary, it's completely optional, but I like to do it because it actually kind of organizes our tests. I think it makes it a lot easier to read and it makes it a lot easier to group them together and add more tests to the file. So next thing that we see underneath our first describe, which is math. So again, maybe not super descriptive, but it's basically that's our top level. This is, all the testing here is gonna be testing math out. So uh, first thing I'm doing there is I'm declaring a constant variable math as a new instance of math, uh, the math class, so that we can use it throughout the test. There may be times that you want to declare a new math every time or a new, this essentially a new class. It really depends on what you're testing. In this instance, because it's more math is just providing me pretty static functional functionality, I've, I felt like it was fine to have one constant math. Um, next thing that you'll see is it. So it is what defines our test cases. And this is where, if, if you think of this as like a kind of behavioral driven testing, we say that, you know, math should be instanceable. Math should sum up two numbers. So you can see it's very uh, kind of uh, behavioral driven, kind of um, common language. And again, that, that really helps in making the tests understandable. So anything within those brackets is just like any other uh, JavaScript function. You can put pretty much any type of uh, JavaScript code. There's no restrictions and what's inside kind of that, that uh, Lambda. Uh, but when, once you get outside the execution, that's uh, the end of the test. Um, again, you can see we have to have a good description there. Uh, inside that, the next thing you'll see is an expect. Expects are our assertions. Um, they're basically checking some sort of condition to determine if what we're attempting to verify is true or false. Uh, this is going to determine if the test fails or passes, and that's how it'll get reported. Um, notice again that I didn't have to import an assertion library. This, this assertion library and the expects come for free with Jest, so there's no need to import a different library. I'm sure if you didn't like the assertions and the different conditionals available, you could import your own. It's pretty easy. That's kind of the great part too. It's, you can, but I think for almost everything you're going to do, um, the built-in the built-in assertions, I think I think are just fine. Um, so let's look at the actual tests that we're doing. So the first the first one that I'm that I'm doing here is um, it might seem kind of innocuous, and a lot of times if I'm testing a JavaScript class. This is the first thing I'll write, and this is really just to make sure that the class is kind of testable. This determines if it's instanceable, essentially. Um, it's a good just kind of smoke test, like is this class even instantiable? Because if it's not, I'm probably gonna have a hard time testing the other parts of it and testing the, the functionality. So again, using, using describe as we move past that, kind of using describe as sort of our category, I'm, I'm breaking this out into the different arithmetic that is available with math. So I've got add, I've got subtract, I've got divide, multiply. Within there, I'm basically testing, there's there's so many more tests you write, but I tried to kind of just show maybe kind of the three main things that I would focus on initially. One is just testing whether the arithmetic actually works and validating that. So um, you can see I'm calling math, well, I've got math, I've got my constant, I call add and I, I pass it some numbers and I expect those numbers to be added up correctly. Also, and you'll see this in the other uh, kind of subcategories for the arithmetic, I determine that you know if I call add and only send it one argument, that, the, that math throws the proper arguments. Also, I make sure that if for some reason someone calls math and they send basically non-numbers that they're also that an exception is thrown. And you'll see that repeat through the rest of these. 
So while we've got the time, let's go let's go up a layer then, and let's look at operate again and kind of kind of think about how we would test that. And I'll show you guys the test. And then after that, we should uh, I, we'll get into running the tests. I'll show you guys how the built-in coverage works and the report that's generated. And I think then we'll be pretty much I think we'll be we'll be right on time then. So let's let's look at let's look at operate again. So again, operate, operate is going to take, calculate is going to call it, it's going to have two numbers passed in and an operation. Um, we're going to parse, essentially it's going to parse those two numbers because right now they're just string. Um, it's going to interpret the operation uh, by checking that string and determining what kind of operation. But let's say for some, again, for some reason, <clears throat> operate was called, something happened, you know, later on in the app or higher up in the app that ended up sending kind of an erroneous operation. Maybe it's sent to null, maybe something failed in the component. So we wanna validate this at this level, ideally. We wanna get as deep as we can. So basically, if that operation doesn't match any of our valid operators, it's gonna throw an exception. And that's something we're gonna to wanna to validate as well. Just kind of like in math, we validated that if you know non-numbers were sent. Also, keep in mind that any Anything that is um, calling operate is expecting a string back. So that's something we can validate too. We can we can essentially validate whether what's returned from this is a string type. So let's uh, let's get right into the test because I can see I'm I am running up against time here. Um, so let's 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 look at these. So again, now also keep in mind operate was a fun is a function. Let's pop back really too quick. So it is a function. So the import is maybe a little different and the usage is a little different. I don't need to declare a, a local variable for it. I, it's not a cl instanceable class. I can't have an instance of it. So I'm basically just calling, <clears throat> I'm calling that uh, that function. So again, we've got describe our top level. This is gonna kind of tell us what all the testing is. This is operate, this is what we're testing. Um, first thing I'm testing here is it should throw an error if operation is invalid. So I'm, I'm trying a couple different permutations. And here you can see too, if you want, within one test, you can have, you can stack a couple different uh, expect assertions. It doesn't have to be one. You could have other code. I'm sure it's tests that are a little more complicated. You may need to do other things. You can put that inside here that it doesn't just have to be expect statements inside the, the Lambda. So here I'm basically sending like an empty operation. I'm sending, Want to make sure there's any like false matching so maybe i send a plus and a minus i send a number we could send null i mean this guy's kind of limited depending on how you know how thoroughly you want to do this um essentially with with all the different arithmetic we want to determine if first of all the i think the most basic thing we could do is determine does it return a string um maybe we don't care yet if it determines a valid string we just care if it determines a string then with the next test, we actually send it, we, we, we continue to send it valid valid variables, but then we actually validate the output. So again, this shows maybe maybe it seems really redundant to test type of, but it kind of it kind of gets to a principle of trying to be, like I said, try to get as modular and isolated as you can. I think it is valuable to just make sure a string's return. What if someone goes and modifies that, uh, modifies operate, and it starts returning numbers? They forget to do uh, to string, or something something gets gets changed and it just screws it up. Then when this test fails, I know exactly why, because maybe maybe at a glance, if I see that op, you know return string result of add fails, I may assume that add is broken. And so I may, it may be like a kind of a red herring at first where, and again, this is a generality, uh, generality, but I think when you get into more complicated apps, this is even more so helpful and more important to do. But then I know exactly why. I know that it failed because for some reason now, it's not returning a string. Or the next level, it is returning a string, but now it's not returning the string I expect essentially. So. Um, so the rest of these are pretty much doing the same thing. Let's get into running the tests and I'll try to make a test fail really quick too. So you guys can see how that works. So running, running tests is pretty simple and actually I should show the package file really quick. So we understand how, so, um, 
maybe those not familiar with node scripts is basically when you call npm and you give it another argument this is what is going this is this basically configures what you're going to launch so in our test when our, our case when we say npm test we call jest and we call verbose and i'll show you um using verbose is really nice and it also show you why organizing your tests makes it really easy to to kind of see what failed to look at what's being test it's something really nice to be able to show say like a, a manager or it's very clear then like oh these are what your tests are especially if you wrote if you wrote them in a very like behavioral way where it, you know math should do this this should do this so it's very understandable what you're trying to test and what you're trying to verify so let's let's run these tests so npm test the most exciting part right you guys have been probably waiting the whole time just to see tests get run so this is great so we had uh two test suites so it considers just considers a test file a test suite we had a 22 test pass and uh 22 total run took about five seconds and we ran all our suites so you can see again this is a really great kind of uh example of how using those describes to kind of organize your test makes it really clean really clear to tell what's going on you can see here that math is our top level should be instanceable that's you know kind of that's that first level test and then we've got add subtract and then kind of each of its subtests same with operate you know should throw error if operation is valid and then we've got addition subtraction divisions and uh, multiplication all broken out so again really great let's let's fail a taste test real quick so you guys can see what that looks like so let's say something does something does change so let's let's change uh let's change math here um well let's make it real <laughs> make it real easy so we know that's going to fail and let's see what that looks like this figure i want you guys to see a, a failure as well all right so so now we've got a failure it says one failed and one passed suite uh we have one failed twice 20 and 21 passed so here is our error so math add should sum up two numbers um it expected uh basically it was checking for object equality and it found that object equality to be false so it shows us where it failed so when it did addition and it returned this it expected it to be a five and it, and it wasn't um so that's kind of that's basically what uh, what an error looks like. I also want to show you guys while I have while I still have the chance here um, the built-in code coverage and what is sort of provided when you run it. So let's let's run that. I'll clear my console really quick, and I should fix that test too because that's going to throw our coverage off. Um, you don't want to fail test for your coverage. So again, built-in coverage, really easy. Whoops. Unless you don't properly I believe that's how it goes. I may I may have that syntax slightly off. You know, just in case, let me see when I ran it last time. Oh, come on, I had to have run it recently. There we go. Yeah, okay. So it's just basically an additional argument on the command. So it's going to tag another argument there. It's going to add coverage. Um, so it runs a test, but now it gives us a coverage. And this looks really great, right? Like we can see how many statements are covered, if the um, you know what the branch functionality covering, align coverage. But it doesn't it doesn't really end here. And it also breaks. It's great as it breaks out by file, breaks out by percentage. You get a good feel, you know what what's covered here. But also a file is generated under coverage so this is really good this is something you could like uh publish in your ci cd this is something you could give to uh like management to show them hey here's what we're covering with our javascript testing here's how much coverage we have here's what it looks like so it generates it actually generates this file here and let me see we'll just open it file manager So this is really great too. This this is like a visual representation of that coverage. Um, it's everything's clickable through. It shows you how many statements. Basically the same information from the 
from the console report, but you, it is clickable through. You can even look at the tests themselves. Um, well, look at, uh, sorry, look at the class itself and how it's covered. Like it shows how many times each of these is called or how many times we run through a statement. So we can see that throw new error gets run through five times. Uh, this return statement gets run through three times. This gets run through 12 times. We're really testing check args a lot. Um, but I think this is really cool. It's nice to be able to look at this kind of metri metric data. And you can see too here that like we're using math 11 times in our operate tests. And then um, we're using parse number a lot of times. We call plus 11 times and we return, we return uh, math to So this is really cool, really useful information, I think, to know. Let's say you have a really big app and you run this and you want to know where, where are some of possibly our gaps. This is a really great way to tell that. So just to summarize, um, we went through kind of an intro to the JavaScript-driven uh, dev step. Uh, we talked about the differences between traditional web development and full-stack development. Uh, we kind of talked about tooling and approach, uh, what tool, uh, tool I chose, and kind of how I approach testing. And we did a demo and walkthrough of kind of a good starter for how you would uh, how you would write an app. So uh, that's all I've got for you guys today. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions. I kind of leave that. I can I uh, pass it back to you, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure how to do that. So if you have a button <laughs> there, I'll I'll try to take it back here. Let's see if I can. Awesome. Let me see. I think I can right click on you. Here we go. You should be you should be presenter. I, I found out how to dismiss you. I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I just here I you. just All made right. you a uh, presenter. Perfect. Thank you very much. So look guys, this is fun. Marcus, thank you so much. That was wonderful. I really appreciate that introduction to Jest. Uh, I know that some folks have been waiting on this giveaway. I wanna do one more thing real quick. Um, there's a quick poll before we go. So I'm launching it now. It says, uh, are you now interested in creating testing with Jest? So answer that, the answers are possible that are yes, more so, the same as before. Yes, maybe one day and, and no. So I'm going to make this really quick. We're not going to get all the votes in, but that's okay. So it looks like we had most most folks were saying yes. So uh, so that's interesting. It looks like you're you um, hit the nail on the head there, Marcus. So that's kind of cool. People are interested in this good work. Excellent. Um, so I also want to see if anybody wants to schedule a call with us. We love uh, chatting about your challenges with test automation. Um, so if you answer yes to that, we'll reach back out to you in a little bit here. So I uh, would love to talk to you about where you are, where you're going, um, the challenges that you see between here and there, and whether or not we can help. So I'm just gonna give this one more minute here, and then we'll close it up, and we will do this giveaway. Perfect, so thanks for answering that. Who's it gonna be? It is Dan S. So Dan S, thank you so much for being here today. You won the $50 Amazon gift card. Make sure to call us, you've got our number there. Uh, international code is one on the front there. Um, reach out to us any way you would like, email or Twitter. And we'd love to talk to you about getting test automation running smoothly. Once again, thanks to Marcus Myers. Thanks to each of you for being here. We appreciate your time and we'll see you next month on the 11th and uh, looking forward to, um, to talking to you soon. If, if you see me at one of these conferences, reach out. Let's talk. Uh, I don't bite. Thanks so much. Bye.